Friends, a very warm welcome to you all to this very special evening. I'm Joanne Greenaway. Uh, I'm the Chief Exec of LSJS, the London School of Jewish Studies. All of us here are in some way students, Talmudim and Talmudot of Rabbi Sachs. We've all learnt from him, been influenced by him, and been privileged to grow up in a time when he spread Jewish wisdom and cultivated Jewish pride. I wanted to say a particular welcome to the Sachs family, to Lady Elaine, to Josh, Dina, Gila, Alan, Brian, Elliot. We're so very honoured to have you with us this evening and all of our thoughts are so much with you still. As I reflected during Hanukkah on the key mitzvot of Pirsumi Nisa, publicising the miracle, it felt that this was exactly what Rabbi Sachs did for us. He publicised the miracle of Judaism and of being Jewish in every sphere. As one of his, his Talmudim said, and I'm sure it was one of our teachers here this evening. He has been such a central and formative part of our lives, and particularly for those of us who teach, that it's become hard to know where no. his thought ends and ours begins. But we know too how important it is that we take his thought as a springboard to learn more, to do more, to develop more as teachers, as students, as people, and as a community. Before handing over to Rabbi Dr. Raphael Zaram, who, who's going to introduce all our wonderful teachers, I wanted to open this evening firstly by thanking our partners. Thank you to Koren Publishers and thank you to the Jewish News. Many of you here are watching on their Facebook Live, so welcome to all of you as well. Koren are, of course, the publishers of Rabbi Sachs's book. And this evening in particular, we're launching and shining a light on this one, his latest book, Judaism's life-changing ideas, which was kindly sponsored by the Phillips family, uh, including Gary, of course, our chair of trustees at LSJS. So thank you. And, and I know thanks and appreciation to you, to the Phillips family on behalf of Corin. Uh, at LSJS, we passionately believe in the future of an engaged, inspired and educated Jewish community, nourished by a lifelong love of teaching and learning by investing in the teachers of tomorrow and supporting today's teachers, we can achieve this, as well as uh, providing a range of intellectually stimulating education programs. Excellence in teaching transforms the community. And this vision we believe is absolutely the legacy of Rabbi Sachs. And I'm enormously proud to be associated with an organization that he led for so many years as principal and as a teacher and then when he became chief rabbi as, as president and afterwards as honorary president. It's not an exaggeration to say that LSJS is ideologically and operationally built very much in his image. And for that, I have to say that we will always be grateful. And I can only thank all of you, the teachers teaching tonight, and also all of you who are joining us from all over the world, uh, over one and a half thousand of you. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for helping us to take this amazing legacy forward. And I'm now going to hand over to the inimitable Rabbi Dr. Raphael Zaram, Rafi, to manage this evening's event. Thank you, Rafi. Good evening and thank you, Joe, very much. It's wonderful to be here. We had the Shloshim and then Hanukkah and for many of us still, it's quite raw, the loss of our Sachs. And we welcome the family and we're thinking of them and we're conscious that this new book that's being published by Colin, which is a bestseller, is actually sold out in many places um, and also supported by the Phillips family. And we very much appreciate that. Um, Joe mentioned um, Rabbi Sachs' connection with this institution. I'm, I'm standing right now in our main lecture hall where he gave so many talks and inspirational ideas and words. And I just want to share with you now to tell you very briefly his story as it connects to Jews College as it was taught. Here we can see going back to 1976, when he was a student training for Smicha with Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich, who's in the middle there. And to his left, you can see Rabbi Sachs, uh, then Jonathan Sachs in a, in a light suit over there. And then two years later, he is in Gold's Green Synagogue, standing next to Rabbi Grunewald as getting ready for their Smicha when they actually become rabbis. And he spoke on behalf of all the graduates at that point. And there he is speaking from Gold's Green um, pulpit, which he actually became the rabbi of um, later on. But before that, in 1982, as you can see here, he was appointed the Sir Emanuel Jakovitz Chair in Contemporary Jewish Thought and Literature at Jews College. So he studied as a student, gained smicha, and then became a lecturer here just literally a year later. 
And two years after that, he became, in fact, the principal of Jews College and grew it incredibly. I can show you over here just another photo moving forward. This is already in 1999, where we changed its name to London School of Jewish Studies. And this was the rabbinic ordination of that year. On the far left, you'll see uh, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Levy, uh, um, who's the deputy president of the college, and then Rabbi Sachs as chief rabbi and president over there as well, with Clive Marks to the right as well, and, and um, Dr. Hillel Rubin. And then if we move on later forward in 2010, the graduation of the uh, 10th graduation of the Susie Bradfield Educational Leadership Program, a wonderful program for training women educators that was run for 20 years at the college. And you see there Chief Rabbi and to his, to his left is Michael Bradfield, who supported this. And you, or, or Dr. Eva Zornberg, you might recognize on the side there as well. And then in 2012, we had a huge Tanakh study day in this room, in which I interviewed him about his top 10 texts from Tanakh. And over here, to finish off, we have in 2003, just before he stood down as chief rabbi, the uh, degree in teacher training graduation at the college. And you can see over here, Rabbi Levy, and, uh, on, and uh, on the left, as we're looking, Dr. Tamra Wright, the director of academic studies, and the far left, uh, Jason Morantz, who was the, um, the uh, chief executive at the time. So Rabbi Sachs, for over 40 years, a student, as, as a samicha, as rabbi, as lecturer, as principal, as president, an honorary president, has been connected with this institution. And he once said when he got up that his deepest connection of all institutions was LSJS. And I know that because the minute he said it, I was sitting next to Sami Rubin and I took out my pen and I wrote it down. Um, so it's wonderful for us to have a connection with him and we are honored by him. Now, this wonderful book, which was launched in September, and he was too ill by then to be able to do a book launch for it. So we very much wanted to do this book launch. And in it, he talks about the importance of Jewish ideas, the centrality of ideas. And he says in the introduction, the idea that transformed him is to always ask, when something happens to him, what is heaven trying to teach me now? And not to ask, why is this happening to me? But to ask the question, how should I respond? And this book is full of ideas of how to respond and how to live a meaningful life. We've gathered together some of his great Talmudim from across the world in America and in Israel and in the UK to share one idea from the book and to connect it to their connect, personal connection to Rabbi Sachs. So well, let's begin now. We're going to go one to the other and we'll begin straight away with uh, Rabbi Dr. Sam Liebens, who is a lecturer in philosophy at University of Haifa. And his recent book, The Principles of Judaism, Rabbi Sachs actually made a comment and said that Sam is a bright new star in the Jewish intellectual firmament. A wonderful connection and a launch for Sam's book. So let me hand you on to Sam to begin this evening with, with, with a life-changing idea. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rafi. Um, it's a real honor to be here um, and uh, to be celebrating uh, the work of, of Rabbi Sachs and the life-changing ideas in this book in particular, uh, and the, and, and the life-changing ideas that he bequeathed to the Jewish people and to his Talmidim and Talmidot as represented on this uh, panel that I'm very honored to be part of. Uh, the life-changing idea that I wanted to focus on from this book actually appears uh, in the first uh, parasha. The, the chapters are organized around the parashiot of the Torah, and the first parasha of the Torah, the first weekly reading of the Torah is, of course, parashat Bereshit, in which we read of the creation of uh, the world. And the, the idea that Rabbi Sachs wants to teach through this Pasha in this book is the idea that God has faith in us. Now, this is actually a theologically bold uh, notion that God should have faith in us. Faith, to many people, suggests doubt or uncertainty. You don't have faith that something is true uh, um, unless there's at least some room for doubt. Uh, now, some theists think there is room for God to doubt because when God created humanity and he gave us uh, free will, he took a risk. And uh, the, the risk means that when God gives us free will, he has to just have faith that we're going to choose uh, to use it right. Now, of course, this leads straight into many more theological puzzles because doesn't God already know the future? And if he knows the future already, shouldn't he know uh, how we're going to use our um, to use our freedom of choice. Uh, there are some theists called open theists. Uh, open theists believe that God doesn't know the future because the future hasn't happened. It's not even there for God to know yet. 
The most famous, perhaps open theist in the Jewish pantheon of philosophers was the Ral Bag, Gerasonides. And I'm not sure that Rabbi Sachs uh, wanted to say something as audacious as that, that God didn't know the future. Rather, I think, uh, it's the idea that faith is actually compatible with certainty. What faith really is, is a type of investment. And the reason why uh, um, Rabbi Sachs is able to link this notion to Parshat Bereshit is because there's this beautiful Sifri, this beautiful Midrash, actually appears in Parshat Ta'azinu, uh, right towards the end of the Torah. But this Midrash, Rabbi Sachs quotes, says that when God created the world, it was an act of faith. Not necessarily because God didn't know what was going to happen next, that that's an interesting question, but because God was invested uh, in the creation of the world. Now, the thing is, the more universal and ambitious your Judaism is, and I think Rabbi Sachs's Judaism had a very ambitious and universal uh, kind of message behind it, the more you should worry, because we really, as a people, uh, often don't live up to the very, very high bar set for us by the sorts of ethical readings of Judaism that people like Rabbi Sachs champion. But the thing is, I think that Rabbi Sachs, he lived a life in the presence of God, and therefore you didn't really feel that there was even a tinge of doubt um, that God exists and that God is real. The doubt, if, it, if there was any doubt, is that we're up to the task. There was doubt in humanity. Indeed, in, in this chapter of the book uh, on Parshat Barathe, he's quite honest about it. He says that, that having faith in humanity is very difficult because of all the terrible, terrible evils that we've done. He talks about his first visit to Auschwitz and the question that was on his mind wasn't where was God, but where, where on earth was man? And in this chapter, he says how if you can't place your faith in humanity, and if you can't place your faith exclusively in yourself, because that would be hubris, and in that way lies a type of uh, moral and intellectual corruption, then we can place our faith in God. And then the redeeming thing about that is that even though we don't necessarily have faith in humanity, and even though we don't necessarily have faith in ourselves, we have faith in a God who has faith in us. And the reason this uh, really touches me uh, is that I think I'm not alone among Rabbi Sachs's students in thinking that what Rabbi Sachs gave us, I wouldn't say more than anything, but in addition to everything else, was a sense that he had faith in us and he believed in us. He would talk about the fact that in his life, he says how his life was shaped by a handful of people who had more faith in him than he had in himself. Um, I think that many of, uh, of, of the people on this panel today who view themselves as his Talmidim and Talmidot felt that Rabbi Sachs invested tremendous faith in us. Um, and I think that, he, that that faith that Rabbi Sachs invested in us was just from Rabbi Sachs's perspective, a reflection of the faith that Rabbi Sachs thought God had in everybody. And so to speak, by placing his faith in God, he was able to refine his faith in humanity. And that can be, I think, a truly life-changing idea. Thank you so much, Sam. That was beautiful. That he lived his life in the presence of God and what it meant for us. Wonderful idea, beautifully expressed. Thank you so much thank you. Uh, for your ideas and for your learning. And good luck with the book. And thank you for this evening. And I'd like, now like to introduce bye-bye um, Alex Israel. Good evening, Alex, who's the uh, Director of Community Education at Pardes Institute in Israel. And Alex grew up in London and was always very much in touch with Rabbi Sachs and buying his books like me and following every step along the way. And I know that Rabbi Sachs encouraged him when he wrote his book, Taught in Two, on the Book of Kings. So if Alex, we could pass on to you, and if we can spotlight you, I think, um, uh, for, to, to pass on to tell us about um, uh, your, the chapter and, and the idea you want to share with us. Thank you so much, Rafi, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about where Rabbi Sachs talks about the power of listening. One of the most powerful scenes in the Tanakh is when the great prophet Eliyahu Nabi encounters God on Har Chorev. Suddenly there's a great and powerful wind that tears the mountains apart and shatters rocks. God is not in the wind. Then an earthquake. God is not in the earthquake. Then a fire. God is not in the fire. 
And then comes a small, still voice. The call to Mama Daka. And God is in that voice. That phrase, call to Mama Daka, is an oxymoron. Because if there's a call, a voice, it cannot be to Mama. It cannot be silenced. Simon and Garfunkel beautifully translated this as the sound of silence. But that too is a, a paradox. And Rabbi Sachs interpreted this phrase in a most original way. And here's what he says. He says that God's voice is a sound you can only hear if you are listening. And I continue to quote, God does not impose himself on humankind. He is always there, but only if we seek him. His word is ever present, but only if we listen. And then he says, the religious encounter like a true human encounter, requires active listening. And I want to talk tonight about this active listening. Rabbi Sachs makes some really critical, incredible points. And I'll highlight four of them. Number one, we always search for God in power. But instead, God asks us to listen. The word, when God says he wants us to obey, in shamoa tishma'u, Rabbi Sachs translates as, listen, really listen. And here we get to the second point, that what is true about God is also true about human interaction. Again, I'll quote, listen to this beautiful line. When two people talk, there is music beneath the words. It is the encounter of two persons in which each recognizes in the other an answering presence. The third point, listening is itself an act of revelation. We activate revelation by our listening. And again, I quote, this is a supremely revelatory moment. And if we can't listen to other people, then we certainly can't listen to God, whose otherness is not relative, but absolute. And the last point, listening is hard. It's an art form. It's tough but we can train ourselves to do it. And again, I quote, listening to another human being takes courage because to listen is to make myself vulnerable. My deepest certainties may be shaken by entering into the mind of one who thinks quite differently about the world, but it is essential to our humanity. It is the antidote to narcissism, the belief that we are the center of the universe. Rabbi Sachs was a master orator, but I think after listening to these lines, he was also an exemplary listener. He was a listener to Hashem, to God. Look at his Torah commentary. It is an act of active listening to the Devar Hashem. He was a listener to society. He was the most perceptive student of society. He loved reading psychology, sociology, political science, anything that explained our world and our reality. And he loved to listen to people. He saw the divine in all of God's creations. He listened to them and believed deeply that God had created them all. And that was the foundation of the dignity of difference. And it pained him when we failed to open ourselves up to each other. In one of his books, he describes the modern Jewish situation as each Jewish movement having tried to climb the mountain of Judaism. And when each of them each different group and subgroup in Judaism reached the summit of the mountain, they suddenly surprised because they're each sitting on a different peak, each unwilling to come down. And what did Rabbi Sachs suggest? We need to open lines of communication and discussion and become part of a tradition of debate, of machloket l'shem shamayim, to disagree maybe, but to listen, to have a conversation. And we, every single one of us, who are contributing tonight are the people we are because he made room for us and he listened to us. The last time I had the privilege to sit and talk to him, I came in with a, a list of questions, which he uh, dealt with, but then he turned to me and he asked me, Alex, what can you teach me? He wanted to listen to me, uh, almost absurd. What could I teach him? And you know what, 30 years earlier, as a young idealistic Bnei Akiva Madrich, I submitted a proposal for a conference to his organization, Traditional Alternatives. And I'll take this opportunity to thank Dr. Erica Brown, 
for that fortuitous introduction because at the time, Anglo Jewry was quite stuffy and rarely gave young people the opportunity to lead. And it was Rabbi Sachs who listened. He adopted my proposal. It transformed me because of course, if Rabbi Sachs took me seriously, I better believe in myself. So this is Rabbi Sachs's life-changing idea. This is how he put it. Listening is the greatest gift we can give to another human being. To be listened to, to be heard, is to know that someone else takes me seriously. And that is a redemptive act. When a person dies, we say, we pray, pray that their memory will be a blessing. But I think we all know, we can already see that Rabbi Sachs's blessing and legacy lives on in his writings and videos and through his many students. May we succeed in bringing his manifold blessings to the Jewish people and to the entire world. Thank you, Rav Alex. That was wonderful. Centrality of listening. And uh, I never had a conversation with Rabbi Sachs where he interrupted and answered his phone, ever. And if we could all do that, we could all do that. Thank you for those wonderful ideas. Thank you. And now we're moving on to Gila Fine, who is the, as you know, passing on to Gila, and she's the editor-in-chief of Magid Books in Israel. And she worked very closely with Rabbi Sachs on a number of books that were published and helped launch him to an Israeli audience. So now I'll pass on to Gila, who's actually going to talk about the last sedra in the book, Abuzot Avracha. So over to you, Gila. Thank you, Rafi. <clears throat> I actually want to start by, uh, by thanking LSJS for this really special evening. Um, for many of us here tonight, this is the closest we've come to a shiva. We've been carrying around this need to talk about Rabbi Sachs and what he meant to us. And, and I want to thank you, Rafi, and Joe, and Sarah, and everybody else involved in organizing this event for, for giving us the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> and as I am the representative of Cohen and Magid tonight, I do want to say one word about the book that we are launching, Judaism's Life-Changing Ideas. I think in a way it's quite fitting that this is Rabbi Sachs's last book. Uh, it is a manifesto of sorts. It goes to the heart of what is perhaps the underlying theme of all of Rabbi Sachs's philosophy, the notion that ideas change lives and that Jewish ideas have the power to make life moral and sacred. I chose to speak, as Rafi said, about the final parsha in the book, Vizot Bracha, uh, partly for, for personal reasons. One of the constants in working on a parsha Shavua book by Rabbi Sachs is that the final parsha of the Zot Bracha was always initially missing from the manuscript. Um, it doesn't have its own Shabbat. Uh, and so Rabbi Sachs would not write his weekly essay for it. And so when we would compile the manuscript, there generally would be an email from me to Joanna and Dan in Rabbi Sachs's office to say, we don't have the Zot Bracha, Rabbi Sachs has to write something quick. Uh, and within a day, I'd have something in my inbox and it was always perfect. Uh, and so for me, the, the afterthought of the Zot Bracha is really Rabbi Sachs at his best, uh, his ability to just pull something out and it be so brilliant and so beautiful. Uh, in the Zot Bracha essay in this book titled Unfinished Symphony, Rabbi Sachs discusses what he calls one of the most poignant scenes in all of Tanakh, uh, that moment when Moses climbs uh, Mount Nevo to look upon the promised land, the land he himself will never enter. And Rabbi Sachs asks, why is it that Moses, the faithful servant of God, the um, man who spent 40 years leading the people toward the promised land, why he was denied the chance to enter it? It's a question that's been asked many times, but Rabbi Sachs's answer is stunning. Uh, and I'd like to read it because nobody can express Rabbi Sachs's ideas as beautifully as Rabbi Sachs himself. <clears throat> For each of us, there is a river we will not cross, a promised land we will not enter, a destination we will not reach. Even the greatest life is an unfinished symphony. Moses' death on the far side of the Jordan is a consolation for us all. None of us should feel guilty or defeated that there are things we hope to achieve but did not. This is what it is to be human. Even the greatest human beings made mistakes, failed as often as they succeeded. What made them great was not that they were perfect, but that they kept going. They understood that life is about falling a hundred times and getting up again. 
It's about getting up every morning and walking one more day toward the promised land, even though you know you may never get there, but knowing that you have helped others get there. These are the final published words of Rabbi Sachs. They read like a prophecy. They also read like a will, an ethical will that he has left us. Rabbi Sachs knew what it meant to be human. I think we sometimes forget that he was underneath it all. He was so towering and majestic, and it's tempting to think that he was born that way, that he was born with the silver beard and the tailored suit and the yellow tie he always wore. But Rabbi Sachs wasn't born Rabbi Sachs. He became Rabbi Sachs. He overcame difficulty and he knew vulnerability and he struggled, he surmounted, he achieved greatness. What made him great was not that he was perfect, although he did come close, but that he always kept going. I remember he once gave me a piece of advice, which I honestly found surprising coming from him. And I said, Rabbi Sachs, you're not really telling me to X, Y, Z. And Rabbi Sachs said to me, well, I'm not always a rabbi. Sometimes I'm a Lord. And this is me speaking as a Lord. Rabbi Sachs was human, like the rest of us. But he became Rabbi Sachs, the Gadol Hadol, this giant in our midst is a lesson to us all. We all of us could be so much greater, do so much more. There is no limit to the heights that we can reach, to the good that we can do for others, to the blessing that we can be to the world. We may make mistakes and we may fail as much as we succeed, but the important thing is that we keep going, keep walking another day toward the promised land. Rabbi Sachs showed us the way, and it's up to us to continue the journey. Thank you so much, Gila, for those uh, profound and very thoughtful words. I don't know what to say after that, but just to say that one, as well as launching the book, having all so many of his Talmudim who have done so many wonderful things shows that he encouraged us to do that and everyone listening to move that, to get up tomorrow and to keep going. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Next, we're moving on to, we're staying in Israel with Rabbi Johnny Solomon, who is a lecturer in Midrash at Lindenbaum and Matt Handelman Institute. He worked through all of Rabbi Sachs' works and on the website of Rabbi Sachs, you'll see the A to Z of quotes, that's Johnny. He's an incredible reader. And when I can't find something, I'll often ask him to find it. So we could pass on to Johnny now for his, for his words. Good evening, Johnny. Good evening, Rafi. Good evening, my friends. Good evening, listeners. Shalom to you all. And I'm deeply grateful to have this opportunity to speak about Moraine Arab Lord Jonathan Sachs, from whom I was blessed to learn from in a number of settings, whose profound ideas I've been privileged to teach to my students. And as a result, whose words have become so intertwined with mine that, as Rabbi Alex Israel so powerfully observed in one of his stunning tributes, it is impossible to know where the ideas of Rabbi Sachs' end and where mine and ours begin. In terms of the life-changing idea that I've chosen to speak about, it is giving thanks, which Rabbi Sachs derives from the Korban Toda, the Thanksgiving offering in his essay on Parshat Sav. According to Rabbi Sachs, apologies, to offer thanks to a presence is a signal of transcendence, which is expressive of something within us reaching out to someone beyond us. In fact, by adopting an attitude of seeking, discovering, and celebrating the good, Rabbi Sachs teaches us that we are led to discover and to celebrate even more good that is worthy of celebration. Tov is goreret tov. Good leads to more good. Toda is goreret toda. Thanks leads to more thanks. As Rabbi Sachs explains, the very name Yehudi, Jew, means thankfulness. Jewishness is thankfulness. And though not the most obvious definition of Jewish identity, this is 
as Rabbi Sachs observes, by far the most life enhancing because by developing an attitude of gratitude, this can literally enrich and enhance our quality of life. However, the primary reason why I chose to speak about giving thanks is not in order to emphasize the emotional, psychological, or spiritual value of appreciation. Instead, it's because I want to give thanks to Rabbi Sachs from the deepest recesses of my heart and soul for all that he has taught me, for all that he has taught my dear friends and teachers, including those who I'm privileged to be speaking with tonight, and for all that he has empowered us to do, both within the Jewish world and beyond. And given this, I would like to offer a personal prayer of thanks, although in this case, while deeply personal, I suspect that this prayer of thanks will be shared by many others as well. Ribona Shel Olam, Master of the Universe. Hakeev Gadol, the pain is great. Shalachta Nasi, you sent us a prince. Kmo Moshe Rabbeinu Shel Zmanenu, like a Moshe Rabbeinu for our time. Moreinu Harav Zaks, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, our teacher Rabbi Sachs. He taught us. He strengthened us. And he believed in us. His Torah was like sweet rain and dew. And from his great words, we grew. And we became great. But even more than the love he had for us, he loved you, God. And he taught us the words of your Torah. So the Lord your God, who haolech imach, is he who walks with you. Harav Zaks, Rabbi Sachs, Tareh Divrei Ashira Zot, he sang the words of this song of the Torah, Bozneinu, into our ears, Musam Otam Bil Vaveinu, and he also placed them in our hearts. Aval, but, you took him from us. And we are all orphans. And yet, notwithstanding this, we thank you, God, for our teacher, Al Torato. For his inspirational Torah, Al Chosmato, the abundant wisdom that he taught us, for Al Morashto, and for his legacy, which we, as his students and his followers, will strive to continue to live, to teach, and to share. Thank you so much, Rav Johnny. That was wonderful. And your use of the computer and how to present to us is exemplary. Rabbi Sachs really valued in those last 10 years going online and using it. And you do a lot of teaching online classes all over the world. A great model of how to do that. We really appreciate what you said tonight and the important messages of thanks. Thank you so much. And now we move on to Rabbi Gideon Sylvester, who is the United Synagogue's rabbinic representative in Israel. He gets to live in Israel and still be part of the United Synagogue. And he actually was a rabbi in England, in London, when Rabbi Sachs was chief rabbi. So Rabbi Gideon, can we hand over to you now to hear hear your words? Thank you very much, Rafi. Uh, Thank you, Chan. Um, Thank you, everybody, and especially uh, to the the family. Um, It's a very special evening, but hard that the star of the show isn't here. 
I think that at the time Rabbi Sachs passed away, all of us were amazed and moved by the letters and the eulogies from princes and from prime ministers and archbishops. I was amazed by the outpouring of grief from friends and acquaintances. But there's one element of the grieving that I think is probably less known, and I only found out about it this week. In one of the grimmest high security prisons of England, there are two murderers sitting in their cells. One of them has murdered a lot of people and he's going to end his days in prison. But nevertheless, while all that mourning was going on, they sat in their cells and they hand wrote letters to Lady Sachs in which they expressed their condolences on the loss of Rabbi Sachs, and they spoke about what a wonderful inspiration his Torah had been to them while it was taught to them by their chaplain in prison. And I love that story because for me, it brings out an element of Rabbi Sachs's ability to reach out to people way, way, way beyond the saints and the scholars that we normally associate as being the students of a chief rabbi. And Rabbi Sachs fulfilled that role for me in a big way, because one of the awful memories of my childhood was endless teachers who, whenever you presented them with a question, would say, who are we to question? And so shut down any issues that you had. And that became even harder as I got older, because as you mature and you become a rabbinical student and then a rabbi, it's even scarier to raise issues and questions that you might have. But with Rabbi Sachs, no question was off limits. He didn't just tolerate our questions, he celebrated them and he sanctified them. And whether Rabbi Sachs was discussing the Holocaust or the difficulties of understanding the judgment of Rosh Hashanah, he took the questions very, very seriously. He spoke about how these are not the questions asked by skeptics or doubters, but by the very heroes of our faith who don't ask questions because they don't believe, but rather ask them because they do believe. And Rabbi Sachs pointed to the heroes of the Bible, to Abraham who asks God, will the judge of the earth not do justice? To Moshe Rabbeinu who turns to God and says, why are you doing evil to your people? To Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah the prophet, who asks God, why are the evil people celebrating and so happy? And for those of you who open up this beautiful book to Parashat Vayishlach, you'll discover an essay where Rabbi Sachs examines the theological questions and struggles of Yaakov. But for Rabbi Sachs, and this is, I think, the second element that makes it so beautiful, it wasn't just an intellectual analysis of deep and difficult questions. There was an incredible empathy and an understanding and I remember once discussing with him on a Seder night, walking back from St. John's with Shul, we discussed what faith meant. And we discussed his books about faith or his booklets at that stage. It was the booklets that he'd written in the 1980s about faith. And he said to me, Gideon, you should know that sometimes in life, faith means just clinging on by your fingernails. And that's never left me. I was so touched by it because for a rabbi of his stature, to be able to empathize with spiritual questioning was so, so, so beautiful and wonderful. But Rabbi Sachs didn't let us off the hook so easily. He may have acknowledged our questions and he did, but he also said that faith was a challenge. The challenge, first of all, to make our world into a better place, to understand that with all the injustice in the world, we simply had to work as hard as we could to make the world into a better place. And secondly, Rabbi Sachs writes that faith is not something that's static. It's something that we have to work on. So after another conversation that I had with him where I discussed some issues that I had, he said, Gideon, now you have to go off and talk to God. He challenged us to work on our faith. At the time that Rabbi Sachs passed away, Rafi, you spoke about Rabbi Sachs as our spiritual father, and I loved the idea, and I thought it was really beautiful. 
Um, and it's true that whenever we went to see him with questions, we would come away with a book list. He was a spiritual father, but I've actually changed the metaphor for myself. And, and I hope this isn't incredibly inappropriate. But to me, Rowe Sachs wasn't just a father figure. He was like the brilliant older brother that I never had because he would share our issues. You'd go to him with a problem and he wouldn't just say, here's a reading list or I'm sorry you've got those issues. He would share with you how it was that these were issues for him too. And he would coach you and help you and strengthen you through them. And that's why I miss him so very, very much. But also why I feel incredibly blessed that we have this brand new book to be able to read and learn his Torah and be nurtured from it. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much, Rabbi Gideon, and an older brother indeed. The challenge of Talmudim and Talmudot is not to be so in awe of their Rebbe that they can't strike out on their own. And he always encourages us to do that. So I very much value it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're now moving on to another person in Israel, Tanya White, who is a lecturer at Matan Women's Institute for Torah Studies in Israel. And after Rabbi Sachs passed, she wrote some wonderful blog posts about him on Times of Israel. And... Uh, and she's studying for her PhD at the moment, inspired by Rabbi Sachs. So can we pass on to Tanya White now? Good evening, Tanya. Good evening. Thank you, Rafi. I'm really, really honoured to be part of this incredibly special evening. And tonight, I'd like to reflect from a deeply personal level on his idea, or his idea in the book on Pasha Re'eh, entitled The Choice. I see it at the heart of many of his other ideas, and it's been particularly transformative for me. Although he died when I was 13, my maternal grandfather had a fundamentally formative influence on me. A Holocaust survivor, he encountered unimaginable horrors in the camps and lost his entire family, but he remained a living testament to the power of choice a legacy he individually bears, but that's so much part of our nation's narrative. Probably under this influence, Holocaust theology was and continues to be a large part of my academic studies. And at the recommendation of Rabbi Sachs back in 2002, during a meeting I had with him just before I made Aliyah, I decided that at some point I would write a doctorate on the post-Holocaust thought of Rabbi Yitz Greenberg. Along the way from then till now, deciding to undertake doctoral studies and then actually actualizing that ambition, life happened. And with it, personal and family challenges ensued. And at one point during a visit to be with my mother, she undertook another grueling treatment. She recommended I read Edith Ager's book, The Choice, about her journey from Holocaust survivor to psychotherapist and, and essentially about her journey from victimhood to, to agency. The power of that story shifted something in me. And then really not long afterwards, I saw, I read Rabbi Sachs writing about her story which came as no surprise as her message was one that I had already intuited in many of Rabbi Sachs's biblical exegesis and his philosophical thoughts. His was always a sustained argument against fatalism and its corollaries. The Greek notion of tragedy, causal law, genetic determinism, and all the like. So central to his thought, the, is the biblical idea of covenant, as I've spoken about many times, which I really think is one of his main, main ideas, that insists on the human ability to choose, to take responsibility and to act with agency, to mend a broken world. Rabbi Sachs's writings on the Holocaust and suffering, which have been central to my studies, also follow the trajectory of Edith Ager's story. She was... Um, a student of Viktor Frankl, and their message was that the freedom, we have the freedom to choose how to respond. Asking what rather than why, as you said, Rafi, at the beginning, allows us to endure and overcome our suffering and find a modicum of meaning 
in the absurd. It's a theology of response rather than of theodicy, explaining or justifying evil, and one that Rabbi Sachs returns to again and again. The Book of Devarim depicts the people on the brink of a new destiny, about to enter the land, and Moshe relays a crucial imperative that would serve them through all their future vicissitudes, and, and, and this is Hachayim v'hamavet natati lefanecha habracha v'haklala uvachalta v'chayim. I set before you life and death, blessing and curse, choose life. The commander is so simple it's in its construction, but perhaps in my mind, I think one of the hardest commands to fulfill. How can we choose life in the midst of despair and suffering? And the answer rests in the difference between, as Rabbi Sachs tells us, victimization and victimhood. Suffering's universal. It's going to happen to all of us at some point, but victimhood is optional. Healing comes when we refuse the self-definition of victim, when we realize the full implication of Moshe's command to choose life rather than death, blessing rather than curse. As Rabbi Sachs writes, we cannot choose what happens to us, but we can choose how we respond to what happens to us. Other people may harm us, but there's always some residue of freedom, something deep within the soul, giving us the resilience to survive. In other words, our blessings are dependent on our internal perspective as much as our external circumstances. How we choose to see our reality will depend on whether we see the blessing or the curse, life or death. As a people, we've had our fair share of suffering and persecution, and we've triumphed precisely because we do not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of victimhood. We choose life again and again, and not in the literal sense, but as a self-defining characteristic. Am Yisrael Chai, we are the people who live. Rabbi Sachs explains that homo sapiens have a unique ability to use the future tense. We don't just focus on the past. Why did it happen? But we look to the future, right? What can I do? Or in Hebrew, we say, don't ask lama why, but rather lama. For what? I can't change the past, but I can change the future because that is the arena of possibility and the domain of choice. Rabbi Sachs's brilliance was to take an idea that speaks to us at an existentially authentic level. So it seamlessly somehow interweave it with the eternal messages of the Torah and, and produce a tapestry of life wisdom. The idea, this idea, the choice, as Edith Egger calls it, or behold, before you stands life and death, as Moshe expresses, is the key not just to our national survival, but it's the secret of human resilience and growth. And it's a message that we need in our corona age more than ever. As Rabbi said, Sachs says at the end, when he talks about the idea, by exercising the strength to choose, we can rise above fate. This for me personally, has been one of the most important life-changing ideas and therapeutic tools that I've learned. And I'm indebted to Rabbi Sachs for infusing it with deep religious significance and meaning. Thank you so much, Tanya. You very passionately explained that fundamental idea of choice and rejecting victimhood, which you talked about. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just had a note from some people who have got issues with the, uh, the pinning of Rabbi Israel from earlier. Only a few of you have that issue. If you have, we've been advised by our tech people to, if you, un, if you unconnect and reconnect again, it'll be fine. And it's completely fine on Facebook as well. So it's a, it's a residual of a certain programs on some of your computers, but otherwise it's fine. Sorry about that. But anyway, thank you, Tanya, so much. And we're moving on now to our last person coming from Israel, because it's getting quite late in Israel already. Um, Rabbi Professor Joshua Berman. Uh, Rabbi Berman is a Bible professor at bar -Ilan University. He's the author of a number of very important books, the most recent one, Ani Mamin, about biblical criticism and historical truth. Rabbi Sachs loved Joshua's work. I know because he told me so many times. And I know that every time Rabbi Berman came to London, they would spend time together. So please, now, Rabbi Berman, can we pass on to you to hear your, to hear your words? Thank you so much. Thank you, Rafi. I I'd like to begin with uh, a line I found in uh, what Rabbi Sachs writes on Parshat uh, Vayakel. 
He says, we need the presence of others to heal, to grow, to help us through the hard times. I'd like to echo what uh, Gila Fine said before, uh, as someone who's sitting in Eretz Israel, these last six weeks, I've wanted to do nothing other than sit in London and be with others who are mourning and grieving and in pain as I am. And uh, the opportunity to share this with you uh, this evening, I'm sure I speak for people around the world uh, in wanting to extend my thanks to the LSJS team uh, for giving us this opportunity to, to as Rabbi Sachs wrote, uh, to have the presence of others to heal, to grow, and to help us through the hard times. Friends, I wanna to share tonight uh, an experience I had with Rabbi Sachs. It was six years ago. Uh, Rabbi Sachs was a, a, a scholar in residence at the Boca Raton Synagogue in Boca Raton, uh, Florida. And I was visiting Boca Raton that Shabbat because my parents live there and are members of that shul. And I realized that not only would this be a special opportunity to hear Rabbi Sachs, uh, but it would also be a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to introduce my father to Rabbi Sachs. But there were two difficulties in doing this. One is that I don't know what goes on in London, but when Rabbi Sachs would speak in Israel or in America, there was just no way you could get close to him. And if you could, it was only with like shoulder pads and, you know, elbows and like that, hardly conducive to introducing somebody. And the second difficulty is that my father has Parkinson's disease and doesn't move quickly at all, barely moves at all, in fact, in any way or, or, or fashion. And so I, I came up with the following strategy. Uh, we arrived at shul and I took advantage of uh, a strange truth about Jews. And that is Jews don't like to sit in the front row of shul. I don't know why that is, but I think it's universal. And so I walked my father to the very front of this enormous, enormous synagogue, the Boca Raton synagogue, right in front of the bima. And the plan was that you know, I couldn't wait till the end of davening because then he would be swamped. So uh, I waited for him to finish his Amida during Mincha. It was a very long uh, uh, Amida, let me tell you. And when he finished, I went up and he saw me and, and gave me a big warm smile. And I said to him, Rabbi Sachs, do you see that gentleman down there in the front row? That's my father and he has Parkinson's and it's very difficult for him to move. And it would mean just so much to him if right after Mincha, if you could just go down and, and wish him a good shot. He said, sure, yeah, absolutely. So I went back to my seat and I began to think to myself, just what is Rabbi Sachs going to say to my father when he comes down after me? I mean, what, what could he say? You know, oh, fine son you have there, Mr. Berman. Right? So Mincha ends and he turns around and he comes down and he approached my father who's sitting, who couldn't stand up. And he says to him as follows, he said, Mr. Berman, I know that you are a very special person because you have a very special son. And I was just so blown away that he made sure that the focus would be on my father. You know, those that have read Rabbi Sachs know that he, is, he writes in a number of places how difficult it was for, for him to observe his own father in decline at the end of his life, or the last 10 years of his father's life, and how that robbed him of, of, of his dignity. And how much, and it was just amazing to me that he wanted to make sure that this was a moment, not only of nachas for my father, but that my father would self, himself would feel dignified and that he made the comments about my father. I know that you are a special person. And just to think that he had the presence of mind to do this, you know, he's about to go on stage in front of a thousand people. Maybe that was, you know, my sim shabachal yom, something that he did every day. But it did remind me that of all the meetings that I had with him over 30 years, I must have met with him 10 or 12 times. I also was Zoha to have that very same sense that he was totally focused on me, that there was nothing else in the world. There was no watch. Someone else pointed out for no cell phone. Uh, it was just as if, as if there was nothing else in his world other than just schmoozing with me. Uh, and I think that, 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 you know, I'm really envious of that because I'm always so focused on the next article and the next book and the next dargah, the next academic level. And, and I think a lot of us are just 
always focused on the next, the next, the next, the next, the next. And I get the sense that he was never focused. Of course, he was working around the clock and all that. But I don't think that just my, my sense, and, and Joanna echoed this for me when I had a discussion with her recently, you know, I think he was very calm and focused on what he was doing. And I think this only comes from a sense of standing before the Rebellion show, that it really doesn't matter in the end. The next Darga, the next book, the next article, you do what you're supposed to do. And if at this moment you're supposed to sit and talk with a smicha student, as I was when I first met with him, that's what we're meant to do now. And if it's time to say hello to Josh Berman's father, then let's think about the best way to do it. And to say to Mr. Berman with his Parkinson's disease, Mr. Berman, I know that you are a special man. And this is a lesson for life that I will take with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. Personal, important story. And I uh, wish you so much luck with your great work. And uh, so much you've expanded on Rabbi Sachs' ideas and developed your own as well. Thank you. And we're going to go from one great academic to another. And we're going to go across the pond now, all the way from Israel to America. But we're going to hear British voice because we're going to, I'm introducing you to Professor Daniel Reinhold. Daniel is a Jewish philosophy professor. He's also the Dean of Bernard, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Yeshiva University. A great achievement. And also he began lecturing in King's College London here and indeed at Jews College and worked with Rabbi Sachs. So Daniel, it's wonderful to have you here tonight with us to share in this wonderful evening. So I hand over to you now. Thank you, Rafi. Uh, it's uh, so lovely to be participating. LSJS is home from home for me. So thank you for asking me to contribute to this special night, uh, which is a strange mixture of celebrating this new book while experiencing uh, the deep sadness that Rabbi Sachs isn't with us to launch it. If I were to ask all of you watching tonight for the most famous closing line from a Hollywood movie. I imagine that many of you, at least of a certain age, might think of Casablanca and Harvey Bogart's character saying, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Well, the first thing Rabbi Sachs tells us about Shemot is less Casablanca and more Fight Club. Uh, Rabbi Sachs describes a meeting that at first glance doesn't bode well for a beautiful friendship since it ends with an argument. Uh, and not just any argument, but an argument that, that Moses decides to start the first time he encounters God at the burning bush. Seeking to avoid the responsibilities of leadership, Moses says, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why did you send me? Since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble on this people and you have not rescued your people at all. There's a beautiful irony to this argument and accusation that Moses launches towards God. And that is that the, the humility of Moses, not thinking himself worthy of leadership, expresses itself by him arguing with God. That's Jewish humility for you. Uh, and Moses isn't unique. The very first person to describe themselves as mere afar of afed, dust and ashes, is Abraham. And when does he do that? while arguing with God about the fate of Sodom. I am mere dust and ashes, he says, but you listen here, God. It's a wonderful thing. And yet, of course, in these cases, it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And Rabbi Sachs uses this to teach us a fundamental lesson, one that was central to his thought and to Judaism. As he writes in the Shemot chapter, God loves those who argue with him. You need to just think of our textual tradition, right? Take the Talmud, one long set of arguments or Midrashic literature with its Shivim Panim, 70 faces, and then bringing us right up to date. And the context for Rabbi Sachs's discussion in this chapter is his defense of free speech against the extremes of cancel culture, particularly on university campuses. Now, council culture is well motivated. The need for sensitivity to others, especially minorities of all forms, is a noble and just cause for which to fight. But like everything taken to extremes, it ends up eviscerating the very basis upon which it's founded, in this case, sensitivity, and if I may, the dignity of difference. And I would add that no matter how seriously we take our most deeply held beliefs, taking oneself too seriously further hampers, hampers civil disagreement. Even God laughs when he loses the argument in the famous Avon of Achnai story. But of course, as Rabbi Sachs further tells us, God doesn't love argument for argument's sake. 
if you're arguing solely to win, then it's not an argument that's worth having. We argue not because we're seeking domination, but because we're seeking truth. Recall that the law followed Beit Hillel rather than Beit Shammai, not necessarily because Hillel's view was true and Shammai's false, but because, among other things, Hillel would first teach Shammai's view, which, apart from anything else, likely brings Hillel closer to the truth. It's only by considering opposing views that you might end up refining your own. So, yes, God loves those who argue, but it's those who argue for the sake of heaven. And it's not only truth that's at stake here, it's justice too, where we also need both prosecution and defense. So justice and truth emerge not by enforcing unanimity, not by silencing opposition, but by creating an arena for civil arguments. I have so many memories of time spent with Rabbi Sachs since my time as an undergraduate talking to him about what to do next to his time at Yeshiva University here in New York in recent years, where I had the honor of being co-scholar in residence with him one Shabbat in, in New Rochelle. I mean, I say co-scholar in residence, obviously I was just the warm-up man. Um, and while it was a beautiful friendship, I have to admit that argument didn't really ever feature at all. But what I do remember is how he maintained his dignity at those times when the battle for truth became a difficult one. To learn from those with whom we disagree, even when we continue to disagree, and even passionately so, but to do so respectfully is one of the things Rabbi Sachs models for me and that we could all do worse than to emulate. Accept the truth from whomever may speak it, Maimonides once wrote, and in that spirit I'll conclude with a quote that at once takes us from that truth straight back to justice, and it goes like this. The quote is, the world is separated into two industries, one being the war industry and the other being the peace industry. People who are in the war industry are totally unified by their ideas. They want to make war, kill and make money. There is no argument there. They just get on with their objectives. But the people in the peace industry are idealists and perfectionists. So they cannot agree with each other. They're always arguing in the pursuit of the perfect idea. That was written by 20, uh, in 2018 uh, by, of all people, Yoko Ono, in a book commemorating John Lennon's 1971 album, Imagine, a song often, albeit mistakenly, characterized as an atheist anthem. But number one, how better to illustrate the value of argument than quoting an albeit alleged atheist, and more importantly, too, it shows us that when we speak of fighting for peace and justice, it is important that we fight for it, but that we do so civilly through argument that always keeps our shared goals firmly in our sights. To do so embodies Rabbi Sachs's big idea in this chapter, which is that when you learn to listen to views different from your own, realizing they are not threatening, but enlarging, then you have discovered the life-changing idea of argument for the sake of heaven. So thank God for argument and thank God for having given us Rabbi Sachs. Thank you, Daniel. That was brilliant and very rich what you said and want to hear it again. So just a good point to say at this point, we've recorded this evening and you'll all be able to hear it again through the LSJS website. There was so much there, Daniel. Thank you so much for doing this. And we're moving on to your co-conspirator. You worked with Dr. Tamara Wright and by Dr. Michael Harris on a book called Radical Responsibility, published in 2013, when he stood down as chief rabbi, celebrating the thought of Rabbi Sachs. And people might want to get hold of that book and see those things. Wonderful that you did that. So let me, let me introduce now Dr. Tamara Wright, who did that book with you. Evening, Tamara. Tamara is now the curriculum advisor at the Faith and Leadership uh, organization uh, through St. Bennett's Hall in Oxford. And for many years, she was the director of academic studies and uh, ran the Bradfield program. So I'd like to hand on to Tamara now to uh, give us another chapter and in her insights of Rabbi Sachs's book. Good evening, Tamara. Evening, Rafi, and thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, Rafi, we've worked together for many, many years and we both have a tendency to ad lib. So I'm gonna ad lib as little as possible and I've deleted a few sentences in order to make time for the ad libbing. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to say as I've been listening to these wonderful, wonderful tributes to Rabbi Sachs is that it has just amazed me not only 
the range of stories and memories and perceptions and understandings and appreciations of, of what Rabbi Sachs gave us. Um, but I, I also organized a tribute event a couple of weeks ago. And one of my former students said, I just kind of tuned in on a whim. Um, because I never knew Rabbi Sachs personally, but I was interested to hear what people had to say. And I learned so much from him just by hearing what people knew him had to say. And I, I was extremely moved by that. And um, I've been finding that the more I read, the more tributes I hear, um, there's always something new. There's always a new perspective. There's always a new story. So I wanna thank everybody who's spoken before um, and everybody's gonna speak coming up. I think the rest of us apart from Erica, oh, Erica and America are here in the UK. Um, so. I also wanted to just share with everybody, I don't know about the other speakers, but I found it really, really difficult to choose my chapter. Um, I would dip into the book and find one and think I'll definitely speak about this. And then the next thing I read, you know, would move up the list and it was just very difficult to settle on one. Um, but I did eventually choose um, actually the Torah reading for this coming Shabbat. And it's the third of four chapters looking at the Joseph saga, which as you all know, is an incredibly rich story. And Rabbi Sachs points out that Joseph developed from a flawed young man into a spiritual hero. And unlike in a Greek myth, his great flaws, including vanity and narcissism, did not lead him to a tragic fate. On the contrary, Rabbi Sachs writes, Joseph's became a tale of unprecedented success, not only politically and materially, but also morally and spiritually. When Joseph warns Pharaoh about the impending boom and bust cycle and advises him on how to prepare, he becomes, in Rabbi Sachs's phrase, the world's first economist. And being appointed viceroy, second only to Pharaoh, is the pinnacle of achievable worldly success. Now in our cedra, Joseph achieves another first and appreciating this one requires a bit of background in psychology. Rabbi Sachs was very interested in the turning point in the narrative when Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers. He tells them that they do not need to blame themselves for selling him into slavery, because after all, it was all part of the divine plan. Joseph says, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God's. This is what is known in contemporary psychology as reframing, seeing negative events in a new, more positive way. And of course, this relates to what Tanya was speaking about as well. Rabbi Sachs sees reframing and related strategies as characteristic of a Jewish approach to human psychology. One that emphasizes key words in Rabbi Sachs's discourse, hope, human freedom, and a future oriented perspective. Sigmund Freud was, of course, the most famous Jewish psychologist. But Rabbi Sachs, following the groundbreaking work of Professor Mordechai Ro uh, Rottenberg, who won the Israel Prize, argued that Freud's approach was actually much more Greek than Jewish. Rabbi Sachs himself was more attractive, attracted to the thought of psychotherapists who were Jewish not merely by birth, but in his phrase, in their approach to the human soul. He mentions Viktor Frankl, who created Logotherapy, based on the human search for meaning. And he also discusses Aaron T. Beck, the creator of cognitive behavior therapy, and Martin Seligman, the founder of positive psychology. And for Rabbi Sachs, all of these psychological approaches were tools that we can use to learn a different way of thinking and a different way of approaching the challenges of life. So according to Rabbi Sachs, there are three key ideas that link these thinkers. Firstly, all of them believe that there is always more than one possible interpretation of what happens to us. Secondly, we can make choices. We can choose between the different interpretations. And finally, most importantly for these psychologists, the way we think shapes the way that we feel. By helping his brothers to a new interpretation, a reframing of what happened to him, Joseph earned yet another title. He was the first psychotherapist. We can't all be Joseph, Rabbi Sachs writes, but we can learn to change the way we feel by changing the way we think. And his concluding life-changing idea for the chapter is that we are not prisoners of events, but active shapers of them.
So I'll conclude with two examples of how I have seen Rabbi Sachs use these psychological insights. The first one took place, uh, took place several years ago when Rabbi Sachs was still chief rabbi. A few colleagues and I had a meeting with him at his house in St. John's Wood. He had recently come under fire for something. It might have been his book, The Dignity of Difference, but then again, it could have been something else. What I remember was that we were angry and indignant about the way he was being treated. Listen guys, he said, over the years, I've learned how to think about criticism. Either your critics are right and you learn something or they're wrong and you can just thank them for the feedback and move on. A wonderful example of reframing a one that I've tried to apply in my own life. And here's a more recent example of Jewish psychology in action, Jonathan Sachs style. And I do mean style quite literally. In an interview of, in August of this year on the Tim Ferriss podcast, Rabbi Sachs revealed the answer to a question that may have puzzled you, um, namely, why the yellow tie? Rabbi Sachs explained that for many years, he only wore silver ties. And we saw some lovely photos this evening of Rabbi Sachs in the silver ties. But a few years ago, he realized that the general mood in society was increasingly one of anxiety and sadness. So he started wearing yellow ties for speaking engagements because he says, whether consciously or unconsciously, people associate yellow with joy and wearing a yellow tie cheers them up. So just as we can't all be Joseph, we can't all be Rabbi Sachs, but there is probably something large or small that each of us could do that would be our own personal version of putting on a yellow tie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamra, for uh, describing, reframing so clearly and preparing us for this, etc. for Vayigash. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to uh, another Londoner, bit down the road in Edgware, Rabbi Barry Kleinberg, who's an NSGS teaching fellow and working on his master's and hoping to do a PhD and partly in the thought of Rabbi Sachs and teachers here at the college as well. So Barry, good evening and we'll, we'll pass on to you now. Thank you. Thanks Rafi. Uh, thanks to NSJS for asking me to share some thoughts about my relationship with Rabbi Sachs and his last book, Judaism's Life Changing Ideas. I personally have always been drawn to the story of Isaac, our forefather, and I found it hard to learn what his message to us is supposed to be. In the essay on the Sedra of Toldot, Rabbi Sachs tells us that the two stories relating to the rejection of Yishmael and Hagar and the deception of Yitzchak in Esau's blessing, we find the Torah eliciting our sympathy for characters who are ultimately sidelined from the future of Jewish history. Given this unusual telling of the story, Rabbi Sachs asks us to consider why Yitzchak and Yaakov are in fact chosen. And he gives us two answers. The first answer is the Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah, which tells us that Yitzchak and Yaakov were righteous and Yishmael and Esav were not. The Midrash cites many examples to prove this. And in the words of Rabbi Sachs, that is an important part of our tradition. However, that's not the plain meaning of the verses in the Torah. Ishmael and Esav are not portrayed as evil or even committing serious sins. Rabbi Sachs points out that both Ishmael and Esav were at home in nature. An angel told Hagar before Ishmael was born that he would be a wild donkey of a man. And Esav is of course the hunter. In the ancient world, nature was worshiped. The ancients worshiped the sun, the moon, etc. In the modern era, Rabbi Sachs tells us, nature is still worshiped. Scientists seek to tell us that we don't have a soul. We're merely a series of electrical impulses in the brain. For these scientists, says Rabbi Sachs, there is no free will, but we are different. The God of Abraham gave us a soul. He gave us free will. As a result, we can ask why. We can think about possibilities that have not yet happened. It was not by accident, says Rabbi Sachs, that God promises the land of Israel to a landless people, or that our forefathers and mothers could not have children naturally. God promised two things to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, children and land. 
These are taken for granted by many because they are part of nature. But our forefathers could barely take children for granted, and we can never take the land for granted. Rabbi Sachs quotes Ben Gurion, who said, In Israel, to be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. Isaac and Jacob were not men of nature. The field, the hunt, the gladiatorial game of predator and prey. They were not Yishmael and Asaph. They needed God to survive. Israel is the people that testify to something beyond themselves, something beyond nature. Rabbi Sachs's life-changing idea number six from his new book is that you are as great as your ideals. If you truly believe in something beyond yourself, you will achieve beyond yourself. And as I was reading this beautiful essay, it made me think of the book written by Rabbi Sachs many years ago, a book that really changed my life, The Dignity of Difference. The Torah in its portrayal of Yishmael and Esav does not paint them as evil. The Torah, God's words, make space for difference. Yishmael and Esav do not believe in the soul or anything beyond nature, but God does not teach us to feel badly towards them, but ultimately to see them as the victims in the story. Rabbi Sachs made space for me several times over the last few years to discuss my PhD and dare I say, Arsenal Football Club once or twice. I never prepared him for what we would speak about, but he could quote chapters and often page numbers from books of philosophy and the Jewish canon off the cuff. Every interaction we had was truly inspiring. Every meeting would leave me with a reading list that would take me years to complete, and of course an excuse to buy many more books. He taught me that we are all created but Selem Elohim, in the image of God, and that is Rabbi Sachs' most important message for me today. Thanks, Rafi. Thank you so much, Y. Barry, and you've developed so much in your writings, and I wish you luck on the PhD and the, uh, and the account on buying more books. Yes, indeed. Thank you. And we're now going to go across the pond again for Rabbi Joe Wolfson. He's a Brit across the pond. He works in New York University as a campus rabbi. And when Rabbi Sachs, after he stood down as chief rabbi, became a visiting professor in NYU, they did a lot together. And Joe spent a lot of time with him. So I'd like to pass on now to Rabbi Joe Wolfson, if you're there, to, uh, to, to, um, to, uh, to share your thoughts. Thank you. Hi, Rafi. Hi, everybody else. Uh, all currently 776 people who are on the webinar and I believe 500 watching on social media and hello to all of my co-speakers. I'm honoured and humbled to be counted amongst you, um, any of you friends and teachers of mine and to be here uh, united with you all as, as Talmidim and Talmidot of Rabbi Sachs and this is just one of the very beginning events of how Rabbi Sachs's legacy and teachings are going to continue. Um, when Rafi sent the list to me the other day of uh, what people had chosen to speak about, uh, I noticed that nobody had picked a Sedra in Bami de Baal. So I decided to pick Parshat Balak. I saw the title of the piece was a quote from a verse which Rabbi Sachs loved to speak about. But not only Rabbi Sachs, it's a verse which I think basically every significant Jewish thinker, certainly in the modern era, has to grapple with. And it's quite interesting to try and situate where Rabbi Sachs falls on the spectrum. The Pasuk belongs to the pagan prophet Bilam, who, having attempted to curse Israel, instead gives them blessings. They are a nation that dwells alone. Amongst the peoples, they shall not be counted. And to appreciate what Rabbi Sachs's take is on that verse, I thought it could be useful to put him into conversation with two other great 20th century rabbis and thinkers and arguably both individuals to whom Rabbi Sachs was indebted and to whom he continued and was in conversation with. The first is Rav Soloveitchik. 
You could probably make an argument that this verse was Rav Soloveitchik's favorite verse. I never met him, couldn't ask him, never asked members of his family, but Rav Soloveitchik was deeply into the idea of loneliness. Loneliness was the fundamental uh, condition of the individual, the springboard for all religious experience, and it was also the fundamental condition of the Jewish people. Uh, perhaps one of his most famous works even captures something of this lonely man of faith. Am Levadad Yishkon of Soloveitchik would have agreed with Bilam's description of the Jewish people. And there's a Zionist political corollary of this. Uh, Yaakov Herzog, great diplomat, former president of the State of Israel, Rabbi Sachs notes that his book of essays is called A People Who Dwells Alone. And for many Zionist thinkers, the State of Israel in a hostile neighborhood, alone without friends, is itself a metaphor for Jewish loneliness throughout history. This is a unique people with a unique history, and that loneliness comes to the fore in understanding Zionism. Now, Abraham Joshua Heschel had a very different approach to this, and Heschel was a, a key figure in um, Vatican II, the Catholic Church, uh, trying to come to terms with its history of anti-Semitism, and Heschel was very much a part of this dialogue and wrote a, an important essay called no religion is an island, and argued that today Jews and Catholics cannot be secluded. They can't be lonely. They have to be in conversation with one another. So he had a lovely line. He said, Bilam says, Am levadad yishkon, the Jewish people dwell alone, cut off from other nations. Said Heschel, only a goy could have said that. Only somebody outside of the Jewish people who did not appreciate the uniqueness of the Jewish people could have thought they could keep their magic and their, their message to themselves. And so Rav Soloveitchik and Heschel read the verse in sort of opposite ways. For Rav Soloveitchik, it's an affirmation of the loneliness of the Jewish people. For Heschel, only an outsider could have said that. And Rabbi Sachs rejects this sort of dichotomy between viewing this verse either as an invitation to particularism or as concealing, in fact, what should be a universalism. Rabbi Sachs cuts between that. He draws on the Nitziv in his comment on the verse to really make a message out of this verse, which was at the heart of his teachings. The Nitziv reads this verse as follows that where throughout the world many nations or cultures can assimilate into the wider culture and with that dwell in peace. The Jewish people's attempt to assimilate into the wider culture has not led to acceptance and friendship, but instead led to anti-Semitism. And the Nutsiv is writing this in Russia at basically exactly the same time as many early Zionist thinkers are beginning to think the same and the way in which Rabbi Sachs reads this and the way in which he develops it is a line which I heard him say many, many times in all sorts of different contexts, but it was especially powerful hearing him saying it to hundreds and thousands of Jewish students at NYU and at other colleges over the years who are grappling with this question of how do I exist as a Jew in a larger plural, diverse environment. If I focus on my Jewish identity, does that cut me off from the larger experience? Does it deprive me of exposure to it? Should I diminish? Should I dilute something of my Jewishness in order to allow for the fuller experience? And Rabbi Sachs's soundbite was as follows. Non-Jews are comfortable with Jews who are comfortable with their Judaism. Non-Jews are made uncomfortable by Jews who are uncomfortable with their Judaism. That is the way in which he understood the Nitziv, understanding this line of Bilam, of Jewish aloneness. And it's a way of cutting between the particular and universal dichotomy. It's really the basic idea of dignity of difference. How can I give 
to the world? How can the Jewish people give to the world? They can do so by being proud of who they are as individuals and as a unique community. And this is one of his core messages. And from the particular vantage point in which I work, there was no message that young Jewish people, whether in New York or London or anywhere else, needed to hear. The way in which you can be a proud and productive member of humanity is to be a proud and productive member of the Jewish people. Thank you so much, Rabbi Joe, and I wish you Hatzlacha with all the great work you're doing with students there. And I know you arranged for Rabbi Sachs to meet so many of them and inspire them. So Hatzlacha with all your work. We're now going to move on to another speaker who's recorded for tonight, Dr. Erica Brown. She's the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership. She's American, but she studied here many years ago at Jews College with Rabbi Sachs. And she's always says to me that he was her mentor and inspirer. She's written 12 books. She's a brilliant educator on the world stage. And she credits her origins and thought also to Rabbi Sachs. And we're very privileged to have this video. We're gonna play of Erica now. Thank you. Rabbi Sachs's 12th life-changing idea is forgiveness, an outcome of his reading of Parshat Vayechi and the closing of Joseph's long and perilous saga with his brothers. As he writes, Joseph forgives. That was a turning point in history for this was the first recorded act of forgiveness. In order to understand the depths of Joseph's forgiveness, we turn to the end of Breshit of Genesis. Genesis does not end where we might expect it to with the giving of Jacob's blessings to each of his sons and then Yaakov's own death. Instead, we find that in its closing chapter, chapter 50, Joseph and his brothers return to Israel to bury Jacob and then go back to Egypt. Once there, an unexpected trauma surfaces as we read in verse 15, Pasuk Tetvav. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we did to him? And it's a pretty reasonable worry. Perhaps Joseph was only kind to them, those who threw him in a pit to honor Jacob, their father. With Jacob dead, the power and balance between Joseph and his brothers weighs against them, crushing them with the thought of their own demise. Rabbi Sachs writes, revenge is one way of restoring the social order but it is a very costly one because it can lead to a circle of retaliation that has no natural stopping point. To avoid Joseph's revenge, the brothers created a ruse and sent Joseph a message, actually a falsehood. Before your death, your father left this instruction. So shall you say to Joseph, forgive, I urge you, the offense and guilt of your brothers who treated you so harshly. Therefore, please forgive the offense of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph was in tears as they spoke. We cannot help but be moved by Yosef's pain. Yosef I love. Why did Joseph cry? Joseph realized at that moment that the reconciliation he had with his brothers all these years was itself a lie or a pretense. Yosef tells his brothers that although they intended him harm, HaKadosh Baruch Hu intended it for good. As Rabbi Sachs writes, Joseph has reframed his life so that the entire drama of his relationship with his brothers has now become in utterly secondary to the drama of divine providence that is still unfolding. Rabbi Sachs articulates this sentiment into his life-changing idea. Judaism, he writes, allows us to inhabit a culture of grace and hope. If we work hard enough on ourselves, we can be forgiven. This sentiment repeats itself throughout Rabbi Sachs's writings. In the in introduction, for example, to his Yom Kippur Machzor, he writes that forgiveness only exists in a culture in which repentance, tshuva, exists. Repentance presupposes, he writes, that we are free and morally responsible agents who are capable of change, specifically the change that comes about when we recognize that what we've done is wrong and we are responsible for it and must never do it again. Forgiveness, he contends, breaks the irreversibility of the past. It is the undoing of what has been done. I'd like to add to this, that it's not only forgiveness to others that is necessary, 
but the forgiveness of oneself that allows us to break with our pasts and start new beginnings. And to that end, I'd like to share a story told to me by a friend in Canada, who was Erev Sukkot many years ago. And this particular friend had wanted to travel to England to speak to Rabbi Sachs. He had an important question to ask him, but he was unable to get a meeting. And suddenly on Erev Sukkot, Rabbi Sachs called him at 8 a.m. Montreal time. When the rabbi took the phone, his first words were hello and an apology for not being able to see him in person and hoping that the call would be adequate. He explained, um, he explained uh, my friend to Rabbi Sachs that he was not a very knowledgeable Jew, but he had one question and it was a burning question. The question, why do Jews fight each other in public? You ask a difficult question, Rabbi Sachs said, and then proceeded with some stories. The two spoke for 20 minutes, and in the end, Rabbi Sachs left him with a beautiful and life-altering message. The rabbi said, in the beginning, Hashem said ki tov, it was good, many times before the creation of man. Who, he asked, do you think Hashem was talking to? And the rabbi, Rabbi Sachs, suggested that Hashem was actually talking to himself. And then Rabbi Sachs said, what do you think the lesson might be? Rabbi Sachs suggested that Hashem was trying to teach us, if I, God, can see the good in everything, then you, human, can do the same. Forgiveness allows us to see the future good in others instead of the sins of the past. It also allows us to see and unleash the goodness in ourselves. And thus, we end the book of Breshit, Sefer Breshit, the book of Genesis taking us from the first act of sin to the first act of forgiveness. Thank you so much, Erica. And again, you can hear these recordings all on our website afterwards. Wonderful to have her involved and you should really read her book. She's an incredible writer. And I know we've overrun a bit, but I couldn't have this evening without including our final speaker, who's the uh, senior rabbi, Joseph Dweck, who's the head of the S&P Sephardi community in this country. Rabbi Dweck met Rabbi Sachs only in the last seven years when he came as the leader of the Sephardi community here, and they immediately struck up a great friendship. And uh, Rabbi Dweck, as the leader of the Sephardi, is the deputy president here at the college when Rabbi Sachs um, was as the, as the honorary president. So I'd like to end by inviting Rabbi Dweck to say a few words about life-changing ideas and his connection to Rabbi Sachs. Good evening, Rabbi Dweck. Rabbi Zarun, thank you so very much. It's a great honor to be able to share with this illustrious panel, great scholars, teachers, and rabbis in Israel who are so appropriately and eloquently honoring, as was said, one of the Gedolei Ador. Um, Rabbi Sachs wrote in his presentation of Parashat Mishpatim about empathy, and he opens it with a story. The story is, I'm going to be brief to tell you the uh, short version of the story, is that an American who had gone to Japan to study Aikido was on a train in the suburbs of Tokyo. And a drunken man came onto the train at one stop who was quite violent. There was children with mothers and elderly on the train. And this young man who was studying his martial arts in Japan thought he was going to have to get up and take this drunk, violent individual down. But what ended up happening was that an older man wearing a kimono called out to the violent drunken man and started speaking to him and asking him what he, what was his drink? And he said, well, it was sake. And the man, the older man started talking about sake and how he, he drank that with his wife in the afternoons. And he began to speak to that drunken man about his life. And the man sat down with the elderly man and was eventually moved to tears. And at the point that the young American had to get off the train, that drunken man had his head in the lap of that older Japanese man and was speaking to him. And Rabbi Sachs's point in presenting that story is that a situation in which that American uh, person thought that he would need to deal with things with muscle and might, he saw nonetheless that it was diffused completely with empathy that the older man, instead of trying to strong arm that drunken man down to the floor, what he did was enter 
gently and with great care into his heart. And he spoke to him from a place of heart. And Rabbi Sachs writes that empathy is a core life-changing idea, but he puts on another layer to it. And he says, although it is something that we share in terms of humanity, we have these mirror neurons. We see people, little children, babies, will hear another baby crying and they will start crying. You smile at a baby, a baby will smile back. There are these mirror neurons. We feel, think, hold what others feel, think, and hold. It is easier though for us to do it when it is with people that we feel that we have in common, that we have something in common with. It's easier when it is family, when it is friends, when it is community. When it is a stranger, it is much more difficult. We are not trained to have empathy for the stranger, for people who think differently, look differently, speak differently than we do. It is in that where the empathy is the challenge for us. It is in that situation where empathy is demanded of us, where really we must bring it out from inside us and present it. And so Rabbi Sachs writes that this is something that is presented in Parashat Mishpatim, where the Pasuk in 23.9, Kaf Gimel Tet says, Veger lo tilhats, do not oppress the stranger. Ve'atem yedatem et nefesh ager. You, Israel, you know the soul of the stranger. Because you were strangers in Egypt. And what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying to us in the Torah over there, says Rabbi Sachs, you know what it means to be different, to be the stranger, to be the other. And when you are not inclined to feel empathy to those that do not look like you, speak like you, or talk, think, act like you, do. Because you know what it is like to be the other. You know what it is like to be the foreigner. And how much would you have benefited from the empathy of those that were instead cruel to you? Don't do it. And that's essentially the message that Rabbi Sachs puts across in Mishpatim. The life-changing idea that he puts out at the end is when you wish to influence someone, when you wish to touch someone, speak to them in terms of their emotions, not yours. Make the effort to try and understand what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What is their perspective on this situation? Hold that perspective and speak to them from that place. Rabbi Sachs was the grand ambassador of Judaism in his life. There was, I would allow myself to say very confidently, no one like him. And there is no question about the fact that one of the most core attributes that Rabbi Sachs had to have in order to be a celebrated ambassador of the Jewish people was to be able to understand with whom he was speaking and to whom he was representing the Jewish people. And Rabbi Sachs did that to many strangers. There were many people who were not of our community, not of our thought, not speaking like us, not acting like us. He walked into their halls to their homes, to their rooms. He understood their customs. He understood their thought. And he spoke to them about us from their perspective. And that is why it, he was so effective in what it is that he did, why he was so celebrated, why. I mean, I was at a, at a just a few weeks after he passed away, I was at a, the, in, in, in organiz, an organized event that was uh, cross faiths that was put on by the actual, actually by the U.S. Department of State. And there were pastors in that setting that paused before they spoke to honor Rabbi Sachs's passing. That doesn't happen unless you are a grand ambassador for the Jewish people of the caliber and on the level that Rabbi Sachs was. Rabbi Sachs did that because of the empathy that he held for all of God's people, all of God's creatures. He knew that he was presenting something very important, a treasure, but the only way that he was really able to convey it was because at his heart, he had the empathy to speak from their perspective about who it is that we were. He did it like no one else. And I watched that. I watched that. I watched him do it. I watched him do it from afar and I watched him do it in person many times. And he never failed. 
And I am humbled and grateful that I had the ability to sit by his feet and study and learn and understand him, not just by reading an essay in his book, but by seeing him practice what it was that he taught. And finally, Rabbi Zarum asked us to present personal points. When I first arrived in London, it was 3rd July, 2014, a Thursday afternoon. On Friday morning, my community was excited and I was grateful for that. Many people were thinking about what it was that we were going to do for the first Shabbat, how the family would be welcomed and so on. There was one person who wasn't thinking about what is going on with the community. There was one person who was thinking about, I wonder what Rabbi Dweck is going through right now. The person who's moved his family to a new country, who is getting to need to know a new mindset and a new platform and a new environment. And that person was Rabbi Sachs. And he called me on Friday afternoon, right before Shabbat. And he wished me well and welcomed me and spoke to me things that only he could know, things that only he could understand about my position and situation at the time. And he continued to do that for the next seven years. His loss is a great one. It is one that I feel very deeply in my heart and in my soul. His absence is staggering. And it is not one that we will come to terms with in near future. It will take us time. And we will always feel that his voice, his empathy, and his heart were a treasure and are missing from us very deeply. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for abiding work. And I'm so glad we ended with that, that focus on empathy and stories about him. So there you have it, everybody. This has been this evening. We've had 13 incredible teachers, all Talmudim, in different ways of Rabbi Sachs. And I want to thank Rabbi Dr. Sam Liebens and Rabbi Alex Israel and Gita Fine and Rabbi Johnny Solomon, Rabbi Gideon Sylvester, and Tanya White, and Rabbi Professor Joshua Berman, and Professor Daniel Reinhold, Dr. Tamar Light, Rabbi Barry Kleinberg, Joe Wolfson, Dr. Erica Brown, and Rabbi Dweck. You know what? People have been writing this whole evening telling me how incredible all of these speakers are. And you know why? One line, because the quality of a teacher can be seen by the caliber of their students. And I commend you all to seek them out. Seek out their shirim, seek out their books and their ideas because they carry on and develop Rabbi Sachs' ideas in multiple ways. And in that way, his Torah and his ideas continue and are focused in all of our community. Now, many of you have ordered this book. It's pretty much sold out in the whole of our, pretty much in the world. We've got a few left in England, which is how we're going to deliver our orders. We might put it back on our website if we can, but there are many other books of Rabbi Sachs that you might want to begin reading. I will end before I pass on to Joe Greenaway to end this evening. I will end with um, a comment of something that I know Rabbi Sachs liked. Occasionally he would watch the West Wing. He was a big fan of President Bartlett. And as soon as Bartlett finished an issue, he'd turn around unceremoniously and say, what next? And just move on. We have to move on. Doesn't mean forgetting the past and everything he's taught us, but taking those ideas, following the Talmudim and coming on with those ideas and moving ourselves. So each morning we, we wake up making those choices, as Tanya said, with confidence, with empathy, understanding and forgiveness and saying what next and moving forward. And this book of life changing ideas will help you do that. Thank you so much for sharing with all of us this evening. And just to end, I want to say, May Rabbi Sachs's memory be a blessing and pass on to our Chief Executive Joe Greenaway for final words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafi. And really, I just want to end by again saying a tremendous thank you to, to our speakers, our teachers this evening. It was absolutely spectacular. Each of you is so varied and inspiring and thoughtful. Um, bringing out so many wonderful ideas and I think it was really just a scratching of the surface and that there will be so many more opportunities for us to learn together to explore together uh, Rabbi Sachs's ideas um, and and to thank all of you here who've joined us from so many places I've been seeing different countries pop up from Bangladesh to Australia to Toronto and San Antonio so it's been 
It's been really a privilege to have all of you with us this evening. Um, thank you to our partners, again, to the Jewish News, to Corinne for helping us to put this event on. Um, and I want to just mention a couple of things that are coming up that I hope will be of interest to many of you. One of them is uh, drawing on much of what you've heard tonight. All of these teachers and more are going to be joining us for a year long course that we're going to be putting on exploring what we learned from Rabbi Sachs and, and in much more depth, but it'll be um, hopefully a real treat. And I really urge all of you to book through our website, through the LSJS website. We also have another event coming up on the 24th of December, uh, Professor Amy Jill Levine, who's gonna be exploring the nativity story from a Jewish lens, a bit different, but she's a fantastic teacher as well. So do book for that, have a look at our website. You can sign up on our website for um, newsletters to get more information about things that are coming up. Um, so please do that. Um, and, and really to everyone, as, as Gita Fine said, when she was talking about Rabbi Sachs's humanity, his quest for, for always continuing to grow, may we all continue to keep growing, to reach our own promised land, to achieve greatness, um, inspired by what Rabbi Sachs has taught us. Um, and finally, to the family, thank you for joining us. And, and really, Arich, uh, Arichat Yanim to you. Yehizuchor Baruch. <laughs>